Michelle, thanks so much for joining Speaking Out of Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta, and today we welcome Dr. Yuli Chetapalli, who is the founder of Innovator MD. Yuli, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Thank you, Apoorv. Yeah, we're so excited to talk to you. And so what you're doing right now as the founder of Innovator MD is helping physicians who are either starting their career, ending their career, maybe thinking about a change in the middle, and they're, they might have an idea for some kind of other solution or tech, something that they're doing, and you help them get that up and running, help them with the resources that they need. And you really like to support companies that are expanding upon the research and the things that you found whenever you were the co-founder and CTO of the Crest Network, which is part of Kaiser Permanente. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Crest Network is a group of physicians that uh, banded together. These are all emergency physicians who wanted to do research. And I was one of the co-founders of the group. Started with two physicians and uh, now it has 14 to, 15, 14 to 15 physician scientists all working on various projects. And my role as the technology lead was to build the platform to be able to do that kind of research in a large system. So one of the things we did was uh, to pull the data from the electronic health record, analyze it, and push back knowledge that we gained from that. The, the, the gist of what that patient's risk is to the physician at the point of care in real time so that they can make decisions based on that knowledge that the, that the machine is giving them. And so it was a great project because you know a lot of physicians uh, implemented it. About a million patients go through the system right now every year. And it's implemented in 21 hospitals. Um, and we published about a hundred papers out of that work. And that's incredible. And you said that because of all the information that has come out of that and all the research that you were able to do through those tools using the AI, that it really alleviates the mental burden that doctors have when they're trying to make decisions about taking a next step on patient care. Yeah, especially in the emergency department, you know, you are taking life and death questions and trying to answer, you know, this way or that way. And that's the main role of the emergency physicians. Um, you know, one of the things about physicians is that they are very risk averse. Obviously, you have to be right. You know, when you're looking at a patient, you know, sending a patient home might mean that patient might die at home. So you have to make those very tough decisions, tough calls. But they are doing that based on their knowledge, based on their experience. But what if we could add? a hundred thousand patients experience that have gone through the same process for the same problem. Now, the physician has a much better certainty of making those decisions because he has the knowledge of this data. Uh, that was the main uh, crux of, of, of the solution that we built. I find that really fascinating, Yuli, because uh, you know that we do this work as consultants and as managers and, and try to help health system leaders and physicians implement this. Yet there's so few examples of technologies like this that actually work. So I'm particularly blown away by what you've been able to accomplish. Can you share with us why you think your approach was so successful? One of the reasons why it was so successful was that, um, number one, you know, the culture of, of Kaiser Permanente. I think the physicians are tuned to making things better for the patients, for the, for the physicians and for the system. And so when all the incentives are aligned, good things happen. Um, as you know, Kaiser is a uh, value-based care system, which means they take whole risk, uh, the full risk it's called, where you know, whatever happens to the patient will be at their, on their dime. You know, they cannot push it to somebody else say that company should pay or this company should pay, they have to pay it. So prevention and, and uh, predicting who is going to have bad outcomes becomes very important because then if you can prevent those bad outcomes, then you, know, you, you, you have a business to run. 
otherwise you'll go out of business, right? Because of the expenditure. The second reason is that the way we set it up was we did it on top of the electronic health record. So we had access to the whole system, the whole data on these patients. And we were able to educate the physicians on, on, what, on, on the work we were doing. And they recognized it. They recognized that, oh, this is important work. You know, when they start to enroll patients into the system, they know that they're advancing science. And so they had this um, ownership of, of, this, of this thing developing. The, the third thing I would say is that, you know, they saw the results. You know, once you start to see the results and how it decreases their cognitive burden, right? Physicians, when they're continuously making tough decisions, it is draining their energy, you know, their brain energy. So when you help them with some of these decisions, so that decision fatigue or, or the, the strain on the brain is decreased. And so they like that. And, and knowing that, you know, this is resulting in, in a much better outcome for the patient, hey, you know, it's a win-win-win situation. I find your story fascinating, and I guess I have just more and more questions emerging. <laughs> uh, you know, in the world of performance improvement that I live in, uh, that we, th we think uh, of, of very few uh, institutions that are really able to do performance improvement in a big way. And Kaiser Permanente is always at the top of the list. And then very quickly, the question turns to, so is it possible to do outside of Kaiser Permanente? Because there's always just a small handful of organizations that are always at the top of that list. So what's your message to us on that? How scalable is this? And can it get outside of Kaiser Permanente to, to organizations that aren't taking full risk for their patients? It is easily translatable uh, as long as, you know, number one, the leadership should buy in. And the second thing is, mainly the physician leadership and the physicians uh, have to buy in. Once they understand the concept, once they understand what is possible, um, I think it, it, is, uh, it is very, very doable. Uh, I don't see any reason why it cannot be done anywhere else. As you said, the main thing is they, sh they are willing to take full risk. And that's, that's where you know, uh, there is benefit um, to the organization when they take full risk. And if they're able to manage that risk and decrease the bad outcomes for patients, the patient wins, the doctor wins, and the, and the organization wins. So that, that's how you need to align the incentives. Why is it so important to, after you retired and did all of your work with Kaiser Permanente and the Crest Network, and then you continued on with Innovator MD, launching that to help others, why is it so important to you that these innovations continue and we're able to keep finding new solutions. The big overarching mission is that, you know, we want to change healthcare. We want to improve healthcare for the patients and the physicians, the two most important people in healthcare, right? The physicians and the patients. So for the patients, it is outcomes. You know, how can we make patient outcomes better? For physicians, how do we decrease their workload, their burden, the burnout, and you know, all those things come into play. So when you put those two things together, what we found was that, well, if there are solutions that can do both, that's the best thing that you can do for the healthcare industry overall. And so that was our focus. Okay, so who can solve these problems? It's the frontline people, the physicians who have the most knowledge and who also are seeing these problems firsthand. So those are the people that can come up with solutions that none of us, well, I'm a physician, I, or at least I was a physician, frontline physician until two years ago, but none of us in the rest of the healthcare industry can understand nor comprehend the solutions that the physicians can come up with. Um, one of the you know, hard thing for physicians is that they don't have the time to actually implement their ideas. They don't have the time to learn how to do business or how to develop an innovation. They don't have the, the, the time to actually form a team or go, go look for funding for that idea. And so that's where 
Innovator MD comes in. You know, we educate them, we provide connections and potentially funding resources that can be brought together to, to bring their idea to fruition. One of your, your colleagues, uh, Dr. Arlen Myers, who you, who you work with on the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, is someone who kind of had a similar story for us. So it's, it's great to have that uh, underlined yeah. through your work. Um, you know, one and one other thought that I had as you were saying that is uh, you had told us a story of of how, uh, you know, in some in a particular case, uh, your your system was able to help the physicians identify a case of pulmonary embolism that I think might be really interesting to our audience if you could uh, recount that, you know, pulmonary embolism, which is a clot in the in the in the arteries of the lungs. It causes hypoxia which means decreased oxygenation, which means that potentially patient can die. So it's a very pretty serious condition. But a lot of patients have small PEs or pulmonary emboli, so that it's not life-threatening, but how does an emergency physician decide whether to keep the patient in because they're high risk or they can send them home on outpatient treatment? So that is the tool that we built to be able to decide that. So initially, obviously, you know, physicians are skeptical. And uh, once they started seeing the results, the emergency physicians, some of them were using it. And then the hospital doctors uh, got a whiff of it and then realized, wow, this tool is great. You know, it, you know, they don't have to argue with the emergency physician whether to admit this patient or not. And the emergency physicians on the other side also realized that, wow, this tool is great. We can use this and tell the hospital doctor that, hey, this patient needs admission because his score is high on our system. And so it, it made people who were non-believers believe in the system and understand once they saw the results, once they saw how easy it is to figure out using you know, 100,000 patients that came before this patient to use that data, that is the real world data, to actually explain what the risk of this patient is. Now, physicians might think, oh, you know, I have I've, I've the knowledge. I've, I've seen 100 cases of this, but how do you beat 100,000 cases of the same problem? And so, as soon as they realized it, everybody started using it. And that was a great success for us because we were able to publish those results and, 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 and the results were great. Before we started recording, you were telling us about blood pressure medication, which is something that a vast majority of adults do end up on at some point in their life. You were saying that it's a big problem that people aren't managing their blood pressure properly despite seeing a doctor for that. So can you tell us how these solutions help situations like that that affect such a huge amount of the population? Yeah, blood pressure is a great example. It's an easy solution we can come up with. For example, you know, there are, you know, I don't know, 50 medications for blood pressure, right? So how does the doctor know which medicine to start in which patient? Um, you know, let's compare two, two drugs, drug A versus drug B. And we can actually track that, go back and look at all the patients that were on drug A versus all the patients that were on drug B and measure their blood pressures or actually read their blood pressures from the EHR. And actually you can look at the results, see which medicine is working better in which type of patient. And so those are some simple things that we are not doing. And so what happens is that half of the patients, the blood pressure is not controlled. And so what is the result of that? Those patients where the blood pressure is not controlled will have bad outcomes. It may not be the same year, two years, five years, but they will have bad outcomes. Increased heart attacks, increased strokes, increased kidney failures, increased uh, dementia, all those things can happen, right? And so there are many, many conditions like that. You know, high cholesterol is another one. And uh, diabetes is another big one. Because we, if we don't control these diseases, they're kind of silent diseases. 
patients may not know it, right? If you have high blood pressure, they may not know it until you measure it, right? And if the physician does not take action on a slightly higher blood pressure, and if the patient does not take action to reduce weight or whatever, that risk keeps growing with time. And so, you know, there are easy solutions where you can actually figure out what works best in what kind of patient. And that's what machine learning helps us in, in, in trying to, you know, identify these populations where which drugs work best. And there may be some very expensive drugs that are totally not worth the price, right? I'm just listening to you and I'm thinking that kind of brings you right up to your punchline, which is that it's all in front of you. It's all in the data. We're just not using the data well enough, right? So uh, I'm not articulating as well as you did earlier. So maybe you can bring it home for us. What is it about the data that we're missing? If you think about medical science, you know, you, you come up with a problem and you come up with a hypothesis on how to solve that. And you do a clinical trial. It takes a few years, four or five years, by the time you get a result, right? Whether it is a drug, a treatment, a device, a procedure, or, or whatever intervention that may be. And uh, after that five years, you know, maybe two or three other people have also studied the same problem and came up with similar results, and it's a good result. And so you take that and the, and, and, and the professional societies, they look at it and say, oh, okay, this is a guideline for disease X. You know, you should use this, this, and this. And then that guideline gets published and it takes a couple of years for that. And then it goes into, you know, into the world, you know, where physicians are expected to pick up, pick that up and implement it. So anywhere from 10, it takes 10 to 15 years for that knowledge to go from the bench to the bedside to actual practice. What if we could do that in 15 minutes? You could do that in 15 minutes using real world data, mm -hmm. right? If you have, you can already set this up if you have the platform set up, if you have the technology and be able to look at the outcomes and actually make decisions. And so that is what I think will be a game changer for healthcare. And that it is crim you know, that technology is already here. It's not like, you know, you need to spend hours and hours doing that uh, or, or years and years uh, trying to develop it. It's already here. And that is one of my passions is that to bring those kinds of solutions to healthcare so that we can make patient lives better and physicians' lives better. Wonderful. Well, that flows really nicely into what I was going to ask you, and that is, why is this your personal passion? And what about some of these companies that you're working with through Innovator MD? What are some of the innovations that you see coming through that really excite you and further ignites that passion? Yeah. So, uh, so one is, you know, I love physicians who are innovators. You know, and we need to all support them. And the reason, because that is going to save us, our children or grandchildren, you know, from bad diseases. So 100% support. The other thing is that I have seen how well it can work in an ideal situation. I've seen that. And I've seen on the other side, I've seen how good the technologies that are coming in the future, you know, especially artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And I, by the way, I wrote a book about it. It's called Punish the Machine. Um, and so we have this technology. So it's like having a, a wonderful drug that can cure COVID instantaneously, but we're not using it. That is the kind of feeling I get when I see these wonderful technologies that are already there and we are not you know, fully implementing or utilizing it. We are punishing the doctors, we are punishing the patients, but what I'm saying is let's punish the machine, which is the computers. Let them do the hard work. 
let them be the best they can be to improve health. So one of the companies that I really like is Health Pals. Uh, by the way, I'm an investor in that and also a mentor for the company. Uh, what they did is they built this engine that can actually churn millions of EHR records and come up with answers for these kinds of you know, problems. You know, will this drug help kidney failure in patients in five years? You can, you can say that with 90%, 95% certainty that yes, it does or it doesn't. Uh, will this drug, you know, $1,000 a pill drug is better than 25 cents a, a pill drug, right? Yes, we can, we can show which one works better. So those are the kinds of questions we need to answer to make improve healthcare. And that's, that's my passion. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It was a really, really fascinating interview. And thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Love to, thank you, Yuli. And thank you all for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.